And we're live. Hold on, let's get that background fixed. Gotta sometimes forget to switch it out. What's yeah, up, cool. buddy? We have a 20 questions tonight. It's been uh, some time since our last 20 questions. I'm very happy uh, we've got another one back in session. This is one of uh, our most exciting pieces of content, at least for me. I, I love listening to them. Um, today, we have Malcolm, a Palestinian, and Rafi, an Israeli, both living in Jerusalem. They're going to ask each other a series of questions. The focus of today's conversation will be each other's respective identities. Our goal, to gain a deeper understanding of each other's culture, history, and narratives. As always, we're going to do an after party on Discord. I think uh, Malcolm probably won't make it. He's a busy man, but Rafi's going to be there to engage the community. You can ask him all questions. You can share your thoughts on this session. And a friendly reminder to keep the chat respectful like our guests. Um, and that's really all I have to say for today. I'm, I'm out of here, guys. If you need me, I'll be listening. So just call me and I'll, uh, I'll come on. But uh, it's all you now, friends. Cool. Bye, Doc. Hi, Malcolm. Hey, Rossi. How you doing? What's up? <laughs> What's up? Thank God. Koshi to man. Koshi to man. Yeah, yeah. So uh, our first question, I'm going to uh, give a little uh, little story. About uh, maybe a month or so ago, I did a show here on Socha called um, The History of Israel-Palestine in search of a common narrative. It's sort of a series that I'm, I'm starting on looking at the, the history and also genetics. I don't know if I mentioned I work in, in biotechnology doing DNA sequencing. So I'm, I'm sort of fascinated in, in that topic. And there's a lot of information showing that, that both Jews and Palestinians have, have really deep roots in, uh, in Israel, Palestine. They recently did a study with like 90 skeletons from, from thousands of years ago. And they showed that the majority of ancestry of modern Jews and Palestinians were, were descendants of these these skeletons, and I'm there's a there's a like a a group on Discord of of guys I know that are doing a, a a little more research on common origins between Jews and Palestinians, finding you know common ancestry, and it's a it's a topic that I that I'm interested in. So I did a show with uh, Dr. Steve uh, Carl Sarecki, who is the dean of Bar Ilan University, a couple of, and he did a lot of the research on ancestry on Jewish pop on population genetics of Jews and also on other people like Armenians and, and Palestinians and other Middle Easterners and seeing where, where everyone sort of fits. And, I, and there was another guy, Sfima Sinai, who is a um, sort of a historian who did a lot of research on Jewish origins amongst Palestinians. So and so we, we brought that up to talk about. So I wanted to ask you, Malcolm, have you there's many studies showing there's common ancestries between Jews and, and Palestinians. Um, do you believe this? Do you feel that exploring this is helpful for reconciliation, for peace work, for understanding each other? What do, what do you think? Thank you, Rafi, for the question. Um, right away, I would say um, I don't think it's a very critical or vital approach to do with reconciliation. At the end of the day, reconciliation is based on humanity and our human identity. And if we approach it first from ethnicity or genetics, it's pretty shallow. So this is first. Second, uh, studies showing that we have similar stuff um, and other studies showing that we don't have similar stuff uh, um, doesn't mean much. Uh, the problem is, when is it a problem, uh, with, uh, whether we have common or uncommon? is when others claim that because we have a common or an uncommon, then we are somebody superior or inferior. So if a, if a Jewish person says, well, we have a common ancestry, so it means we really belong here and God gave it to us and this proves our belonging over the Palestinians, well, down with the ethnicity yeah. and the approach. Okay, now if they say, oh, we have common, wow, I feel connected to the Palestinian, or vice versa, oh, Palestine, oh I feel connected, we're family, then hallelujah. <laughs> it's, it's the approach. 
uh, I don't think, um, with all due respect, I also did my own research. I don't think some of the uh, studies are the necessarily the overwhelming uh, research over commonalities. A lot of other studies doesn't show that many, uh, many or some Jewish people, particularly maybe European Jews, necessarily have Judean uh, genetics or ancestry in the sense of direct. But why not? If they're Jewish, amazing. If that's what they feel. At the end of the day, last thing to say for this, what identity is what we choose to belong to as long as we don't abuse others over what we be, claim to be or what we feel to be genuinely, et cetera, et cetera. That's in short. Fantastic. So she, you want me to ask the, the same question? Yeah, I want to yeah. yeah, wanna hear you now. Okay. So, I mean, I mean... I, I've done a lot of a lot of research and I've read almost all all the papers on this, but I agree with you in terms of the the overall approach. I think is is what's important. So I can tell a little bit of, of the story. The first studies were done about like 20 years ago, showing mainly like paternal ancestries that most Jews and uh, and Palestinians had had similar paternal ancestries, at least on their on their father's side, father to son. And this was this was what I was looking at when in, maybe 20 years ago when I was in university. At about the same time, I also started getting involved in, uh, in peace activism because I, I, I went to yeshiva in Israel. I had studied here and I was living through like the, uh, the second intifada. And first when I came here, everything was great. And then after that, it, it got less great. And then I went back and I thought, Man, we should really do something about this. And I, I started researching it like reading the Bible and reading the Quran and trying to like understand each other's cultures. And I remember I used to go hang out. There was a prayer room at my university where all the Muslims would do their would do their prayers. It was a prayer and meditation room. And I used to go and like do my Jewish prayers. And I remember I used to I would sit there and I was reading the Quran because I wanted to learn about about Muslims. And I would sit in the Muslim prayer room with a kippah on a Jewish guy reading the Quran. And I would just make friends and people were like, what are you doing there reading the Quran? Oh, I'm like this is a very interesting book. And I would start you know start talking. A lot of them were were Indian or Pakistani, Afghani. But I remember one time, like a friend of mine said, hey, that guy's Palestinian. And like, I, I go over and I meet this guy and he looks like, just like, like an Ashkenazi Jew. I was expecting he'd look like, you know, you know, from uh, Aladdin from, uh, you know, or, or something, something different than I imagined. But I'm like, you just look like your name is Amichai. Like, how is this? So we became really good friends and we started hanging out. I met a second Palestinian who also, we said he was from Hebron, but he said his family really way back, they came from like Spain and they were really Jewish. And I'm like, what is this like a Disney movie? Like we're all really family and, and everyone will <laughs> we're all hug and get and you know, really, that was a big mistake. We're really we'll all just get along. So I got I got excited about reading about this this research as I went out one time. After university, I came to Israel. I read an article by this guy, Sfi Messina, who was on my show, and he wrote all this, you know, research into uh, cultural customs amongst Palestinians. And sometimes there are customs that sound Jewish. I know I had a, a co-worker who said they used to step on a glass. At the wedding, like, and they used to take a piece of the bread and stick it to the side of the oven. It's like this tradition in the Bible called challah that we do. And so I'm like, hey, maybe it's true. And I and I, I started getting into it over the time, and I and I, I got to know Svi. And over the time, we were involved in a project called the Best Plans for Peace. So different people would write different uh, different peace plans. And so ultimately, I feel like his his perspective was a little bit flawed. I think on common ancestry, and yes, certainly some Palestinians have some Jewish roots. I, I I've definitely seen that in people I've talked to, and that, that makes some sense. But um, I think his perspective was that in order for us to make peace, the Palestinians will agree that they're, that they're Jewish. Well, that will sort of change how they view themselves. And I feel like that's, that's a mistake in terms, in terms of the perspective on finding common identity. I feel like when I, I do my, my shows or, or various things, I, I try to show, listen, like you can show that Jews and Palestinians have, have deep roots in this country. And, and, and somewhat, they're actually, in some cases, actually, you know, you could trace them father to son to the same guy, you know, 4,000 years ago. Maybe it's Abraham or something, you know? And, I, and it's really cool to find, to find this, this commonality. But I do it for the purpose of, you know, learning, of learning respect for each other and trying to get, get Israelis excited about learning about Palestinian history and Palestinians excited about learning about Jewish history, but not trying to change how they view themselves. I don't need Palestinians to say, I'm, I'm Jewish or I'm Israeli now in order to make peace with me. You need it. The basis of peace is I have to accept you for who, for your identity and you have to accept me the way I view myself. And that's, 
And that's how we come together. So I think if used in the way where you're trying to tell other people to change how they view themselves, that's you're on the wrong direction. But if you're trying to find a, a you know a thread of commonality so that they that they get interested in learning about each other and each other's culture and feel like oh, you know we both belong here and we're like like you said, I feel like that that can bring some positivity. So there's there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. So I try to do the right way. Yes, totally agree. Amazing. That's thank a you, thank great you. piece and end the whole conflict now and after seconds. God willing, inshallah. Inshallah, yes, inshallah. So uh, the next the next question are are your attachments to the land, are they more religious or more cultural, or are they both interconnected and you can't separate? Like is is this the land of Jesus that Jesus walked to you and the land of the Bible, or is this the land that Malcolm grew up in? Or <laughs> which okay. one? So um, maybe the words are limiting in the question, but why not? Um, well, I'm a Palestinian Christian for those who are listening and don't know. That's why maybe Rafi mentioned Jesus. Sure. Uh, but definitely Palestinian Muslims also feel very highly connected to Palestine or the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, for me, it's... Um, Every, everywhere we, we connect, everywhere we spend time, even if it was uh, in Australia for one year, we, we get an emotional attachment, we call it in psychology. Uh, because we can, that's how we humans were made out of love. And creation, I believe, we are created for love and by love. And thus we connect first with things, especially in childhood, that's why we connect so much with places we're born with or we're bo where we're born at, we connect through love, emotional attachment. So Palestine for me, and I'm saying Palestine because that's the word that speaks to my heart. Um, I'm very connected to the land because I was born here. And yes, it is meaningful to me that Jesus was here, but it doesn't matter. It, what matters for me, Jesus brought a message, not where he walked physically. Uh, if he walked in uh, Germany, if he walked in Iran, yes, I would maybe be interested in the land and from that perspective, but the place I would belong is a place I, <clears throat> sorry, formed an emotional attachment uh, with. Uh, but what's higher for me is I'm a very emotionally attached to my people. And those are the ones I love the most. And I'm willing to live for and die for, even in Palestine or in any other piece of land on this planet. So for me, it's not the land and it's not the physical piece of physics, a piece of stone. It's rather living stones here. Even the Jewish heart, including the Jewish soul and the Palestinian soul. But first and foremost, I put a priority for my people because I was born Palestinian, so I give priority for my family and then to my neighbors. This is just the healthy hierarchy of how we deal. Somebody who's married, he puts his wife first, not because he hates the neighbor, but because his wife is a priority emotionally. And then he gets and gives priority to his neighbor. And it should be uh, respectful, of course, priority, not secondary kind of, are oh, you less important? But emotional attachment-wise, definitely priority is always to people. So yes, for me, the peace of land is about the peace of heart. It's about the people here, not about the physical land, although it has meaning, but it's not first for me. It's not the priority, although it is important. So for those who are listening, oh, so Palestine doesn't matter. No, what matters is the heart of Palestinians to me first. Then Palestine matters, but they are first and foremost. It's beautiful. So, um, in my turn? Please, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, do you prefer um, I for you, or do you want me to, because you, you can ask, if you, if you want to rephrase it, or if you feel like it's, I phrased it well enough. You can, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, you phrased it well, but I, I'm, I'm giving you also the freedom from the limited words, culture, religious. Those words didn't speak to me much. It's more the family. Sure. But yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. So for me, I, I didn't, I wasn't born here. I was almost born here. My parents lived here until just before I was born. 
So I was in the womb, like breathing the air and then smelling the food of, of, uh, of Israel or Israel, Palestine. But I, I and I but I grew up in, in Chicago, in America, and I went to very like religious Jewish schools. And for me, Israel started out as, a, as an idea, as a dream, as something we would read about in stories as from, from Abraham to Isaac to the, the tribes of Israel to all the prayers we say where we hope that, that we would be redeemed and come back and the story of, of being in our land, being, being conquered and taken away as prisoners and then coming back and then again and, and this belief that one day we would all come back. And I'd never seen this place, but I, it was just a, a, like a never, never land. It was a dream a place to, of a place to like the perfect world, you know, the ideal, the ideal place to where, where my, where my culture came from and where we would believe like when, uh, when, you know, in the, the time of the Messiah, we would come back and, and be one day able to live. Right. And then the first time I was here, I was, I was 12 years old and I went to summer camp here and it was, it was a totally different experience. All of a sudden this, this dream I had was a real place and it was unbelievably beautiful. Where I grew up, it was very, I mean, it's also beautiful Chicago, but everything was flat. Here, there's there's mountains, there's deserts, there's just amazing nature. And I was in it was in the summer. I went a little bit to the cities. I remember the first place I saw was, was Jerusalem, and I really loved Jerusalem. Like the old city, you see all these dome top roofs. You know, you live there. It's it's incredible. You're like, I've never seen something like this in America. I'm like, wow. And then and then they would take us to all these nature places. We would take you know to the banyas. We would go kayaking. I would go. I went down to Elat. They would take us hiking in the desert. I remember they woke us up at. At two in the morning, once to hike up Mount Carmel when I was twelve years old, with like little boots and everything, couldn't go out of the way. And we, we got to the top by the end of the night, and just like I just fell in love with the with the beauty of the nature of the land. Like this was wow, this is like an amazing place that that God you know promised to, that I could come back to, and here it is for me. And and it was a place that I loved, and I never I never associated with any conflict because I didn't I didn't grow here here as a as a kid, so it was like just this sort of this paradise for me. And then I came back a few a few more summers. I would come here all the time, and I really I really would love this love this country. And then I came here when I was like eighteen, right when about the uh, the second intifada started. And then I saw like everything. It was like this beautiful paradise, and I'm like, wait, something here is not going quite right. Like why why is there this this tension? Why are there bombings? Why is I hear shooting in the background? It was very it was it was very it was like paradise lost, you know. So why 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 is this all happening? So it started to, you know, to try to think about, you know, what, what we could do, you know, to make, to make things better. Right. And, and now that I, and, and, after, and then I went back to America and I went to university and, and I started programs to bring uh, Jews and Palestinians and Muslims and, and Christians all together to talk about like the, our, our shared culture and, and religions and also how to, how to get along in this country, you know, that, that I really love. So when I, when I came back here, I, as an adult, I also, you know, I started to live here. And my parents, my parents eventually moved here when I was like in college. And then I developed a, you know, a, a different relationship. I, you know, I had all my friends and all the the places I've been and all the people I know. And like, like more like your relationship, you know, where I have uh, like like the family. This is the place my family lives now. I have children and a wife and and everyone who lives here. So it's it, it's it's complex on multiple levels. It's uh it's a spiritual place. It's a place where you feel God's presence in 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 your in your life. And, and guiding you, and at the same time, it's a place like where I, you know, eat chicken soup at my mother's house. So it's, it's, uh, it's everything. So that's that you feel also. Ah, please continue. No, no, please continue. Do you feel also any connection to the place you were born, to the U.S.? Oh, absolutely. I feel very, I'm very culturally American, and I feel like that helps me a little bit to look at this situation because I see it, I see it from an outside perspective. I can. I have my hat, one hat in 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 the land and one hat out. So I'm I'm able to look at from the side and say, well, you know, why are you guys you guys fighting here? What's going on? You know, and I so I, I remember there was in America there wasn't Jewish and Arab conflict. I never had a problem with Arabs as, uh, growing up. But there was there was uh, black and white conflict. There were gangs and and violence, especially in Chicago. I don't know if you know, but there's a there was big there was a lot of crime and there was you know if I, I would see like a big black person with a, a certain color hat walking down the street, I might get scared. And so I, I knew I knew what the conflict looked like, but it, but it, but I but it didn't look like this. So this is I'm like, you know, trying to put so I can see it from a, from a sort of a side view. So I do I do feel culturally very connected to America, the idea of, of, of liberty and freedom and, you know, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And I, I, I like those values that I grew up in America. And I, want, I like to bring some of that here. I feel like that. 
that would be good, you know? Amazing. Thank you. My pleasure. So, so what does it mean to be a Palestinian to you? That's the next one. You sort of touched on it. Yeah, what, what does it mean to be a Palestinian? What is Palestinian national identity or, or, or the identity? Sure. Um, what is a Palestinian national identity in particular? Yeah. Or Palestinian in general? or anything? Either one to touch on. <laughs> I think I touched upon it already. Yeah. So my question was leading to this naturally. Yeah. Um, so I would say more, more as as a, like a national identity, as as you are. Yeah, as yeah. Your country. I will, I, will yeah. Sure. I will reiterate. Sure. So Palestinian for me is a today is a connection to an oppressed group that I want to liberate and I want to live for and dream for liberty together from oppression. So on one hand, the identity is pretty much connected to oppression. And so it gives it a certain painful um, side. On another hand, it gives it meaning to run forward for hope. And from another side, being a Palestinian for me is very honoring because I love my people who are still suffering. And so it's a, it's a connection with a lot of meaning that gives me purpose towards my life. And that's how I perceive being a Palestinian. Yes, it's connected to Elam as well. But it's first and foremost, as I said in my previous answer, it's connected to Palestinian heart that's beating with pain and shouting, crying for justice and hope. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So. For me, to being an Israeli, I, I love being Israeli, but it's it's very complicated. I mean, to us, it's the the liberation of, you know, it's two thousand years of a lot of a lot of suffering and a lot of oppression. My my family like had had been in Europe before before I got here. They were what's called pogroms. They were they massacred uh, you know thousands of, of people in in, uh, in the Russian Empire, and people started fleeing. Like two and a half million Jews fled fled Eastern Europe to move to, to America. And a small number of them started coming to Palestine, you know, with this dream that they could they could rebuild their, their ancestral land and be back in, in the one place where where they felt safe. Because God God had promised them when they that in the end of times they would come back here. And so they believed in it that when they come back here that God would protect them. And 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 so it's very meaningful. Like I you know I, I sing a tikva and I have tears in my eyes. The, with the Israeli flag, and I know know how many people suffered to, to make this happen. And at the same time, it's it's complicated, as because obviously other people are suffering. There's and Israel. Israel is a country that I love, but it's also a country that it has somewhat of an identity crisis. They we say that we want it to be the nation state of the Jewish people, but there's 20% of Israelis are really half of the country, is the way I see it. Are there's a large part who aren't even citizens, and half of the country or 20% are citizens. And they they have an Israeli identity, which is almost which is almost strange, because Israel is also the name of, of my ethnicity. So it's like Armenian, right? It's like having a country called Armenia. At the same time, there's an Arab who says I'm an Israeli Arab. So that like like in America, I can be a, a, a German American, I can be an Italian American. So it's something Israeli, but it's also we don't we don't consider it an ethnicity in itself because it's really our ethnicity that we gave the name to the country, and some people also identify as. Arab Israeli or Druze Israeli, and so it's really it, it is a multi-ethnic country. Even Israel, not even including the West Bank. I mean, they say all the more so. Kal Homer including the West Bank and Gaza. But with just even Israel now, I think if, you know you push two to, to hear Arabic, you push three to hear Russian. You know when you call the you know the phone company. So it's that it's it's a multi-ethnic country, and it's part of what we're proud of. When people Israelis will say, "I'm so happy there's a you know we had a judge on the court who's Druze or who's Arab or there's a." a you know, minister of parliament 
you know, we're not racist. I'm going to say, that's amazing. So, but why, but at the same time, it needs to be a Jewish state. And they're like, in, uh, you know, it needs to be like a, a nation state. Like is it, a nation state is a state where it's overwhelmingly Jewish. And it's, as you see, it's even in our politics, it's not, it's not quite working because, you know, if they, the Arabs have the 10 or 12 seats, they're able to change, change our, our government. So they, they're, they're actually included. So they need to be included also in, in the way we view, the way we view the, the country. And I also consider myself a, a Zionist. And I know that most Palestinians, they don't want to hear. I say I'm a Zionist. They're like, you know, I stabbed them in the heart, you know. But uh, so for me, my middle name is Zion, right? Zion is, um, is Jerusalem to us. Zion is the, is the Jerusalem of King David and King Solomon. It's the vision that we should be, you know, brought back like the days of old, you know, that God should redeem us and we should have, and we should have Zion here. And we should have... Uh, and that, that's the name that they put onto this this sort of this this movement to come back to our homeland. And not I don't agree with everything that everyone did in the name of Zionism. I think a lot of people did wrong, obviously. But to me, that uh, to me being a Zionist is one is someone who wants to come back to my to my homeland. And I think of myself as an ethical Zionist. To me, I, I want to return to my homeland, but I have to do so peacefully and diplomatically and with consent of the other people that are here, so that we can we can build something together. I didn't come here. Uh, after you know two thousand years of being in exile to go push my cousins off the, out of the land so I can have it for myself it you know why would you why would that make sense you know so that's that's what it means to be Israeli so it's it's a complicated feeling it's something I'm proud of but at the same time I I, I, I deeply want to fix so you want to fix you know, the, the way it started or the way it's continuing today with the occupational system well, yeah, I can't fix the. I can't go back in the past. I don't have a time machine. I can't go back, and sit everyone down, and say, "Listen, guys, you're going on the wrong path here. What you guys need to do, and God, you know, halibai, as they say, you know. But it's not. It, that's not it can be. But we can start with now. You know, we can have that conversation. You know, talk about what we should have done then, and, and figure out what we should do forward. I think that's what's cool. important. Yeah. So the conflict that you're feeling is that now. The, the way it's done is not necessarily, I don't know, uh, ethical in some ways or? Yeah, well, there's, there's ethical, I mean, I could, I, I will, uh, well, uh, the next question is about the conflict. But uh, so, yeah, I think that, that it needs to be, like I believe in the right for the Jews to return to our homeland. And I believe that this is like, you know, part of our, it's so deeply part of our culture. For it's, it's a true part of who we are. And it's a true part of our, our dream for, for thousands of years. But in order to do that ethically, you need to do that with consent of the people who live here. If you were sitting in a park bench and you got up to walk around the park and you get back and someone else is sitting on the bench, you can't push him off the bench. You can say, hey, can I sit on the bench with you? Okay, let's work it out, you know? And you gotta, you gotta find a way to come back in, a, in an ethical manner and do things and do things fairly. Sure. So the next question is, uh, does your religious belief affect how you feel about the conflict or about the other side? Again, sorry, Rafi. Is does the... your religious belief, does your, you know, your, your faith, does it affect how you feel about the conflict? I, you definitely touched on it, but. It's uh, as any question. I think questions, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, for the sake of writing them, they can be very limiting, but they're fun. They, we have to write yeah, them. Yeah, they give a little bit of a frame. <laughs> but yeah, as, as everything in life, like ma humans are made of, we're multi-layered, multi-dimensional. So yeah. spirit, body, blah, 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 blah. so we have a lot of uh, multi-dimensional. Yeah, is that my, does my religious affect, I don't call it religious, by the way. I don't believe in the institution of current corrupt religions. Uh, but I do believe in the institution of love by the Creator. Sure. Now, uh, does the love of the Creator affect how I feel about the conflict? Definitely. He's my source of loving those whom I cannot love. Because Jesus says, love your enemies. And to me, he gave me the power to try to love. And to love my own people as well. It's not like I'm uh, even worthy of love myself. So God gives me to love myself first. 
in order to be able to love others. So yes, it affects me very much. But also all the other layers affect me. My relationships with others, with my people and with the Jewish people brings me a lot of insight. It brings me a lot of hope to end the conflict and to co-resist together, not merely fakely coexist. And that's what kind of conversation that I believe in. It's not about agreeing, it's rather agreeing to co-resist what is unethical. But at the end of the day, many people disagree with the ethics and it's a big philosophical question. Sure. So um, I, I loved your answer. I mean, I, I, would, I would say I would agree with almost every, everything you said. Um, I, I had some different ideas to bring up just to talk about how it is in Jewish culture, like how we view, we view the land in that, right? In, in the Jewish religion, I mean, I'm also a very spiritual person and I believe that, that you know, that God made, made people so that we can appreciate the world. And what he wants us to do is to take care of our fellow man and, and the natural environment and to love one another and to be his partner in making the world better, tikkun olam, right? To, to perfect the world, to make the, to make the world. And that, I believe that's like the, the fundamental Jewish, Jewish principle. And in, in Jewish sort of traditional Jewish thought about the, the Holy Land, non-Jews are allowed to live here as long as they believe in basic rules like don't kill and don't steal and to, to love God and to love your fellow man, then, then, then everyone is cool. But there are also ideas in our, in our religion that say this land belongs to us. And there are, so there's, there's statements that are, that are challenging, right? I like the opinion of, of uh, Rashi, Rashlomi Yitzchaki from, from France about the, the 11th century. He wrote a comment on the, the Talmud, which is in Aramaic. Maybe sometime I'll read it to you in, in the Aramaic and see how, how your Aramaic is doing. So What's they discussed, uh, his Reb Shlomo Yitzchaki. So he was in, the, in France, and he was a commentary on the Talmud. The Talmud that I'm talking about was written in, in Iraq at the time, in Babel. It was now Iraq. And so they were discussing, two rabbis were discussing whether or not, whether or not you should live in Israel. They were living in, in Babylon. They were in the, in the exile. They had brought, been brought there from the first time. And the first, the first you know, the general topic was that the land of Israel is better than all the other lands. To live in all the other lands is like to worship idols. Compared to, it's better to live in a city where, where people worship idols in the Holy Land than to live in any city outside, you know? And then one rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda said, but you're not allowed, you shouldn't go back to live in, in the Holy Land. He said, because God had taken us out and he promised to bring us back and we should wait for him to fulfill our promise. And then so Rab Zera, another rabbi in, who un, and this Reb Zera, he wanted to move back to the Holy Land. He was in Babel, and he all his rabbis tried to convince him not to, and eventually he left, like in the middle of the night, and moved back to the Holy Land. And he says, "You can you can go, but you can't come back. You can't come back like a wall. You shouldn't come back like a, like an army and and invade and invade Israel and not come back all at once. You should come back humbly and peacefully, and then." And then, you know, maybe in the end of times, God will bring everyone back in a, in a magical thing, but a person can go. And so um, the opinion of Rashi was that what he means when he says don't come back like a wall is he means that you should come back peacefully and diplomatically. And um, so that's what my, my perspective is that what the, what the Jews did, a lot of them will say, well, we did come back diplomatically. The Belfort Declaration said we could come here. But the, the Balfour Declaration said you can make a homeland for the Jews in Palestine on condition that they have civil rights and religious rights for all the people who live here. And so, and I think that's a, that's a reasonable way, although I know Palestinians don't like the Balfour Declaration, but I say, at least do that. You know, you will say you want to come back here, give civil rights to everybody first. Now, I also believe in the, the principle of consent. Like, they, it's great that they got the British to approve of it. They needed to talk to the Palestinians also. That's how you do it diplomatically with the actual people who live here. Uh, Halavai, as we say, you know, uh, if only we should do that. But um, so I think that that in order to do so religiously and, and, and to be whole with it, on one hand, we should come back to the land. On the other hand, we should do so peacefully and do so in, in accordance with international law and in accordance with, you know, morality and, and, and equal rights for people. And I think, and that's what we call a Kiddush Hashem, that like sanctifies the name of God by doing something challenging, returning to your homeland, but not being unethical in, in the process, going out of your way to make it, 
make it right. And Rafi, maybe a quick question. I know it's big, but you can comment shortly because of the time. Um, as a religious man yourself, mm -hmm. how, uh, where is it in the Bible where God allows the people of Israel to come back peacefully? Uh, this is in uh, Ketubos, because in the Bible, I mean, in the, so in Judaism, we think the, the first five books, those are like the main rules. So everything that's written by Moses supersedes anything else. So they, we would always come back to that and saying, God told Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that I promised you. And in there, I don't remember the exact verses, I can send you them, that he says that, that I'll cast you out and that, you will, that I will bring you back in the end, of the, in the end times, that I will bring you back in, in, uh, in peace. So there's there's an uh, there's an idea because these the the Jews when they when they were expelled they were living in in Iraq and and dreaming of coming back and this was their their prophecy this vision of return. But allow me one second. I meant to continue the question. I'm saying, how do you know this is now the voice of God to bring back Israel since it was not peaceful in 1948 first, and second, right. it's not continuing peacefully, and third, there is no prophet. There's no somebody hearing from God like in the Bible or in history. There was always Samuel, Joshua, Moses. There was always somebody hearing <laughs> prophetic, prophetically from God. Then how sure. do you know today as a religious Jew, if I consider, how would I know this is the voice of God bringing me back? Or is it my own desire? Because I have a connection a, with them. So how do I know which one is over or taking over? So I, I think there's there's a little bit of both in in like in everything there is you can look in verses and definitely find verses that that we would come back and there's those that say like notori carta you know we should wait we should wait to come back you know and that's what a lot of the very religious would have, had said originally when the zionists were mostly secular jews they said let's go back and they said no we need to wait for for a miracle which it'll happen you know miraculously and not not by through our own actions and then the, eventually there was a movement called them um, dati lumi the the religious zionist movement they believe that that God was acting through the His hand through the the secular Zionists, even though they were sinners, that they were bringing His 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 desire, His divine plan into fruition. That this is what He wanted, that 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 He meant to. And now we're here, so it's not you can't you can't ethically undo what has been done. Now you have six and a half million Jews who live here. We can't go back in time and pull them out. Sure, sure. So there, it's not about pulling out, but still, how yeah. do you know this was God? You're saying they analyzed God is using, but how? What is the proof? So when Moses so believe that was proving God, God is everywhere. God, God creates history. God is what. One second, look, Rafi. Biblically, okay. we're biblically, the Jewish identity is based on the Bible. Allow me to challenge you, if you please. So okay. biblically, anybody who wanted to prove something was from God. They needed to have many things to come with: prophecy, miracles, signs. Wonders. So Moses, God told him, go take my people. Okay, he gave him a whole uh, miracles of different types of miracles over Egypt. And then he split the sea to take them out. So there was uh, a whole types of evidence and proofs that God's hand was there. Where is one evidence like this? Only one? Yeah. What happened with Zionism. Now, the people even did not even believe in God. <laughs> That's not necessarily true. Herzl himself didn't believe necessarily in God. He was agnostic, atheist. I'm not so. Where is this? Uh, Moses was a believer. The prophets. Right. People, so where? How do you then know this is? So there was the, the first religious. Well, so it's complicated. To develop how how Zionists, the first religious Zionist movement, called the Mizrahi movement, the Rhinite Zionists. They were oh. they they were religious. And they followed the Zionists because they believed it was called Pikuach Nefesh. They were defending their lives. They had to leave Europe because they were going to die. Because they had okay. to preserve themselves. They had no yeah. choice. They were, they, they, this was the hand of history. They also happened to be religious. They were like Zionists slash religious. So they, would, they went with the Zionists because otherwise we'll die. And they, they were religious because they were religious before. And then there was there was uh, Avram Yitzchak Cook. He was the, the chief rabbi of, of, of Israel uh, at the time, pre pre nineteen forty eight, and he said that he believed that the Zionists were working, that God's hand was working through them, even though they were secular deep within their hearts, they were doing what His will by coming back to the, the Holy Land. But obviously, because they were they were imperfect, they didn't 
they didn't make good all good choices but sure i hear you yeah. well, let's assume somebody else comes to you and that promised me i don't know the land of iran <laughs> at one point i was persecuted in saudi arabia and i went back to iran and i had to also kick out some people from there so does that is that god's hand how do i know it's god's hand no, so you have to it becomes you have to you have to rectify everything that you do that's wrong you have to you have to fix you have to if you in the in the port in the course of coming back here which maybe that was god hand they ended up getting in conflict with people and people ran away you have to lift a cane you have to fix things you're not the the work of god god didn't make the world perfect you have to you have you're here to to work you're here to help make the world better so there's 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 still fixing to be done and there was a lot of bad that that happened so sure that's, I hear that, you. that's, that's, that's in, what i believe so in it was not history we have we have uh, uh, foundation principles of how to know something is from god but anyway that's another topic yeah. but just if somebody says i'm a prophet today how do i believe him well because he's living imperfectly no it doesn't work like this even if he has a nice purpose so a prophet has to prove him like Elijah brought fire from heaven and so yeah. on and so forth. So there was no prophecy, no prophets since 2000 years in Jewish history. Right. And to claim suddenly that God's hand mysteriously works through secular people is biblically not sound. But I'm open to hear your perspective on uh, that. I mean, they, I they would point to... They would point to the prophets of old, the biblical verses saying that, that even that, that God would bring you back. And then... You're but who's back. Said he didn't. Rafi, he already brought them back. The prophecies were fulfilled back in the Old Testament. He brought them back from Babylon. They were taken to captivity, mm -hmm. and there was no more prophecy after they came back by Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah. There was never any more prophecies when they were brought back by different right, people. But they, so they believed that this coming back would be forever. So they, that's how they interpreted. That's how. That's Judaism. I mean. Now that's the difference Judaism and Christianity. Christianity believed that the the final redemption happened in the in the form of Jesus. That Jesus was the the King Messiah. Forget about it. Right, right. But, and so sure, Judaism yeah. believes that we're still waiting. That that it will be an actual redemption and not necessarily a spiritual redemption for uni universalists. Although there's a lot of connections, obviously, between Christianity and Judaism and philosophy. Sure. sure. I mean, but so, it's, uh, at the end of the day, how do we know which interpretation is true? It's not like, oh, I chose to interpret this way. Well, another person gets the Bible and chooses to interpret it like to kill everybody you see. You know? Like if, if yeah. that, how do we get to interpretations? It's what we call hermeneutics. We have to get to the, what we call the science of interpreting old scriptures. And it sure. has to be taken into context. And the reader's re relevance is the key. So what did the reader back then understand from such verses? He was understanding yeah. that about Babylon, not about 3,000 years after. No, but, uh, but what, did, what, did the re what did the readers in the time of Jesus believe? They believed that there was a, why was there a Messiah? Because they, they, were, they were suffering again. They were free, they had their own kingdom, and then they were lost. They were under occupation by the Romans. And they believed I, that God brought us here and promised everlasting you know, being in this land, and that that uh, David Melch Israel Chayvakayim, David the King of Israel, will live lives and exist, and that the the, the royal line will will rule uh, will rule Israel, and from there they will spread light onto the world. All these these ideas. So they believe that that was still happening in their days. That's why they, when they're listening to Jesus, they they think we're waiting for a miracle. We're waiting for redemption. They're not necessarily waiting from coming back from, because they were here, but they're waiting to be liberated. They were ready to be, you know, the Yemenu Kekedem. They want to renew your days like the days of old. They wanted to have, you know, God's presence felt and not be under these, these, you know, pagan uh, rulers oppressing them. So this is, and the Jews didn't believe that Jesus was this guy, right? Because the idea that there was going to be a redemption was was a, was a thought. And then there various Jews thought there were there were military leaders who would redeem them, that they would be the Messiah, right? That they would, you know, physically fight the Romans and expel them and, and liberate their land, like like Hamas or something. You know, they would uh, they would have uh, an intifada and they would throw off the oppressors. And then, but it didn't work. And they got they many of them were killed. Some of them, uh, my my family was taken off to slaves. You know, the rest of the Palestinians they stayed here, and the rest is history. You know. Sure, sure. It's a long topic. We'll continue. It's a long. Yeah, we got a couple of questions. Let's try to try to Thank hit you. on them. My pleasure.
Uh, how does your identity impact how you feel about right of return for Palestinians and Aliyah for Jews? How does my identity affect that? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't quite understand the question. <laughs> Can you elaborate? Okay, so so when I originally wrote it, it's not clear. It's like I could say, how does your identity affect how you feel about right of return? But we wrote, we, we ended up writing it for both people. So you could answer on how you feel about Aliyah if you want, or you could just ask, how do you feel about Hakulauda? How do you feel about oh, the yeah, right of? Yeah, how do you feel? What is this this principle? Simple. Anybody who's taken away from his house should have the right to get back. Simple stuff. Is that, that, that doesn't need identity. That needs right. just humanity. <laughs> so, so then identity comes into play. So if some uh, Swahili, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, like African uh, person would say, how do I feel about Palestinians going back to their house? Well, if it's their house, they should go again, have the right to go back. Sure. <laughs> if they disagree with that, then they have a problem with their own human structure. So it's not about identity. Of course, Palestinians feel more, and like Israelis would feel more about yeah. that. We would feel more about the right to return. The difference is, the big difference, mm -hmm. and not to tease you, but people who are coming back uh, through Aliyah were not necessarily kicked out by Palestinians now, uh, and sure. are, they're getting their rights back. Whereas we have a right back, which goes back only to, to 72 years, and until today, Palestinians are kicked out of their houses. So we still have a right today that we need to get back to, which is not happening, as opposed to the Jews who uh, feel like the 2,000, 3,000 years ago connected, and now they're coming back to with all the rights and privileges and taking over Palestinian houses. So the other one for me is pretty unethical, sorry mm -hmm. to say, pretty inhumane in its practice. And it's cruel okay. and it's against the humans and humanity in many ways. Okay? It's not bad for Jews to be here. That's not my argument. It's bad for them to come here based on other people's lands and taking over. Even yeah. if they belong here, they can come here visit here, buy ethically here, but not claim this is my land because I feel belonging here. If I love Germany, it doesn't mean it's my land, Rafi. Yeah. It means I would love to live there, I would go and live there, and one day I would become German, why not? It doesn't mean it's my land. Even if it belonged to me in the sense of belonging and kingdoms and governments and those, you know, all uh, facade or, or systems, let's call them, that we govern with humans just to, for the sake of continuity. So, speaking of that, uh, anybody would love to go any, in any place of this face of the planet, since you're religious or you believe in the Bible, God said, this planet Earth is mine, and you humans are my guests. He doesn't say yeah. it is yours, and, and this is a blah, 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 blah. And he sets the foundation. So we're all guests here, temporary living. We need to co-share, not keep claiming possessiveness. Okay, this is for me. So Palestinians' right to return is not a claim for possessiveness. It's a claim of bringing justice and ending theft. Not because they have to be here physically. It's rather to end the unethical movement that is still going on and justified with the Israeli laws all the unethical laws. I'm sorry I'm getting a bit like here uh, firm about these things. But yes, for us, how do I feel about Aliyah? Pretty unethical. How do I feel about right of return? Pretty unjust what's happened to Palestinians. And they should be allowed even if they don't come back. Because that's the real right of return. Whereas the other one is just a gift. It's like uh, Jews have, uh, have the right to come in. So it's just a privilege. There's, there, is, there, is no, there is no gain from it, even if I avoid the conflict. There's no gain from it for any other people except the Jews themselves. It's selfish. And from another perspective, they're stealing other people's lands to come back and other people's privileges. So that's a big issue. Okay. So I feel, as, as a Jew, obviously, a little differently about it, that this, is, this was our... This was, this, this was my... This was my was my land, 
I, I was here. I think the Palestinians may, they may have also been here when I last left. I don't know. You know I'm, not, I'm not objecting. <laughs> but I believe it is my, my right to come back, and I support that right. But I need to do so ethically, even though I support it. Like, it goes back to my, the, my story about the park bench. If you're on the bench, and you get off, and someone else is sitting there, you have to ask nicely to get back on the bench. Right. You have to find a way to share. And... And I think, and I agree with the, the the religious opinion that you know you should come diplomatically and peacefully and make make an honor to God in the return to the Holy Land and not do it at, at the expense of others. I think that's the the most important thing. I think there there's a concept we call um, a nida kenegan mida. That's like an action for an action. It's like what goes around comes around. I think in some ways on a, on a spiritual level, what what God is teaching us by this story, it may be hard to hear for, from you, is that. And the Jews, they were, we were suffering in Europe and we were, and maybe in other places in the Middle East, but particularly we were being massacred and about to be great, a great genocide. Like it also happened to, to your people as well, that uh, in, in Armenia, but, um, and they wanted to come back. And, and I, I don't assume all the Palestinians were aware of what was happening to the Jews. They saw the people coming here and they were afraid of them, but the people who were coming here were, they didn't see what they were running away from. They were, except for the first wave of Aliyah, and only a few of them ended up staying, that every group that came after was running from another major attack on the, on the people there. And they fled all over the world. And some of them came here, and there were, different groups would go everywhere. They were, being, they were being expelled. And some of the Palestinian leadership didn't want to let them in. They were afraid that we're going to become a minority if we let too many people in. They're going to take over. And I, I also blame some of the Zionists that started saying wrong things. And then... And and then they were and they were on the other side. The Palestinians were here, saying, "I don't want to let these refugees come here because they're going to take over my country." And now the situation is reversed. God put us, it's changed the the turn the tables. And now by the Jewish people, my people are saying, "I don't want to let all of them come in. They're going to take over my country, and I'm going to be I'm going to be oppressed." And so I think what, what, in order to to reconcile in a sort of in a spiritual way, maybe not as a, in a personal way, but to understand it, is that. We need to, to see what the other person didn't see when, when, this, when this was started, that, they, that we need to see what it's like to be a refugee. And remember, we were refugees, you know, or we have to remember every day that we were, we were slaves in Egypt and we were brought here by, by, God's, by God's gracious hand and that we, we need to feel for them and want to accept them. At the same time, they, they need to understand what it's like to have been outside and want to come home. And, uh, and they should remember when, we, when they were afraid of us and that, and that, and that that understanding of, of that principle of consent. And so I think now, now that you have six and a half million Jews, let's say all over Tel Aviv, and you could say, well, these Palestinians, these used to live in this house. And are you going to say, well, are we going to move this Israeli out of his home that he grew up in because his grandfather lived in this house? You know, it, it becomes it becomes similar. Maybe it's not the same as my ancestors lived in Febron 2,000 years ago or 1,500 years ago or, or whatever. It's not the same. But there's a similar idea that I didn't personally grow up. I grew up, you know, I was attached to an America. That's where I, I was born. And this Palestinian maybe has lived in, in America or he's lived in Germany or he lived in, in Jordan or somewhere else. And that's where he grew up. But he has a memory, he has a, a story that this is the that this is his dream to come back. And we have to we have to honor each other's dreams. And I, I think that's one of the most important things to be, to be a dream catcher. You know, that that's the that's how you reconcile. So I think there's honoring religion. And, please go ahead. So I, it's it's religion, but also psychology and, and spirituality. It's you know I try to look at it holistically. So yeah, it, it, but honoring each other's dreams doesn't mean honoring unethical dreams. I will never someone's dreams. Who let's say somebody who dreams to be a football player, and he has a chopped off kind of he lost a leg. It's very inspiring that he wants to be a football player. But if he tells me, for me to become a football player, I need to chop off just a few other legs of people. I will not honor that dream, even no, if no. I share with him the dream of becoming also a football player. So for me, the problem with the Jewish dream of coming back here is the claim of entitlement. Philosophically, mm -hmm. from the onset, it is unethical to claim that this is your land. Even if you feel you do it, you can do You can believe this discreetly, but you do not come and say, this is my land, explicitly, first. Second, you can say, I'm here coming as a guest, and I'm willing to live here, like you saying, ethically and humbly, 
And then yeah. you, you wait for people to accept you and honor you and cherish you. Third, there's no justification, as you already agree, I know, whether people were kicked out to come back, come here or not kicked out, that's out of the question. That's just like justifying the abuse by abuse. It doesn't work yeah. this way, which you agree. So the whole, the whole, with all due respect to you, and I know this is, can be provocative to any Israeli, the whole claim of Aliyah or coming back is, to say the least, to say the least, partially of it, shallow, shallow. And it's not based upon ethics, justice, human rights, equality, rather Jewish supremacy, racism, historic entitlement for what man, the Persians were here, the Romans were here, which today part of them, maybe we can say some Italians descend from so many people were here. So <laughs> we have so many nations. We have the Cal like the Albanians who are from uh, different people who were here like the mamluks were albanian muslims we have so many nations who, who were who were here on ottomans why would then they just come back and say, well I, it's my country i want to have this is mine and it's mine and i want to go back to it i have the right well i believe that humans have the right to live anywhere peacefully not have the right to claim lands theirs that's a different claim i this i disbelieve in any claim saying this is my car, I want to get back to it. If it was two thousand years ago, mm -hmm. as opposed to I would love to have this car again. It was like the one I had. I would love to have it peacefully, and I don't claim to be it mine today. But I'm willing to work towards that, lovingly, respectfully, humbly, and justly. And if I do anything wrong, I'm willing to re recompensate and so not say, "Oh, let's forget about the past." Well, Israel as a whole was founded and still founded illegally and immorally. Where is Israeli's conscience here to wake up and say, well, let's fix this whole thing. Not by pulling out Israeli now, oh, let's kick out now the 6.6 .6 million, 6.5 million Jews. No, by first admitting, second, stopping the abuse, stopping settlements where you partially live, stopping building and taking Palestinian land, stopping demolishing of Palestinian houses, stopping claiming I'm coming back to my homeland, Living in peace, saying, let's, okay, let's, let's, this is, this should be this priority, Rafi. The priority should not be a cute conversation between me and you. The priority should be co-resisting, bad, unethical, unhealthy, evil, inhumane, destructive, terroristic values that are continuing here. The continuous cycle of violence and conflict and terrorism, the real terrorism is the initiation and instigation of theft. That's why a thief, if he comes to my house, last thing to say for you now about this, if a thief now comes to my house, even if he doesn't have weapon and tells me this is my house and he sits almost physically peacefully, but he's telling me, he's claiming that this is his house, in my house, nobody would ever claim, blame me if I go and beat him up and kick him out. Nobody would blame the victim. Yet Israelis are calling the one who's defending his, himself the terrorist because it seems explicitly violent. Whereas the one who's claiming the theft seems to be implicitly nice and kind, which is a whole twist of reality and a whole twist of human psychology and how things work. The instigator doesn't get to be blamed much because sometimes he starts like small. That's why it's a, the bully has muscles. If he comes and just even spits at a child, he's, uh, he did something small, but he's with muscles. So who gets blamed if the child gets a knife and, and gets it into his into his leg. That gets blamed. Oh, that's terrorist. Oh, that's savage. <laughs> now, don't you didn't you see the instigator of violence? And why are you not going back to the instigator of violence? That's why people don't have a problem if I if I speak about different analogies such as the rapist and the rape. They don't have a problem to blame the rapist, but they have a problem sometimes to blame the thief. They rather blame the one who's stolen from. But they don't have a problem to blame the rapist. Oh, he shouldn't have raped her. Well, she killed him at the end. Oh, well, it's in self-defense. Oh, why didn't you see that when others came to steal someone's land? Although I'm, not, I'm, I'm all against violence. And it's never justified for me, except in one very sole condition, the very end, if it's the only solution to defend one innocent life. That's the only, for me, justification. And it's not even good there, but it's the only solution. It's for a better not even for, it's not by good by itself. So why, why don't people see that? 
Because unfortunately, we're so twisted and we're just focusing on this explicit, like somebody who's who's like uh, provoking somebody with a, with a, like a very whispering voice. And then they see a woman shouting, Wah! and they, they call the woman an uncivilized, a savage, and somebody disrespectful, lack of ethics. And they forgot that the instigator has been whispering maybe insults into her ear. And that's the blaming of the victims that unfortunately many Israelis like get it uh, as if we're in equal grounds and, uh, and Palestinians are doing this and that. And yeah, yeah, they. So they went into a place that you didn't comment in, uh, comment at yet. Forgive me. But sure, we sure. And another sort of two questions because I mean, so that was the that's question seven, but we can. Uh, so I, if you want, we can go back to question six. Calm down a little, and then we'll go back into to who's at fault here. So question six was, do you have an unconscious bias towards Israelis, regardless of your 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 nature, your, your worldview? Do I have, again, sorry? An unconscious bias towards Palestinians. Do you, or towards Israelis. Are you biased against Israelis, based on uh, your experience? Unconscious, maybe? unconscious would mean I'm not aware of. <laughs> okay, so which probably I would say I don't know, but uh, probably yes, because we are we are a byproduct of uh, discrimination. I was shot at twice. My family was kicked out in 1948. I still face racism on daily basis. So definitely unconsciously, yes, of course I may I might have stuff here and there, but do I consciously choose to reject any bias towards any Israeli or any human being? Definitely yes. Do I have any unconscious biases that are overwhelming me? No. Do I have any, un like I'm walking in the street, I see Israelis, I'm like, Ooh, feeling like Ooh, all the time, most of the time, a bit of the time, not even close. But it happens, I'm sure. I face racism on daily basis, daily. Just saying my name, speaking English instead of Hebrew, people start questioning my integrity, start accusing me of being a liar that I don't speak Hebrew. They start questioning my, uh, like, where are you from? No, you're not Palestinian. You're, they start denying who I am daily, even hourly. Yes, so I have, I'm sure I have unconscious reactions. <laughs> but yeah, but it's not a choice. I wish I'm clear. What about you? Um, I, I actually think I like Palestinians. Generally, <laughs> I have. Yeah, I, I um, maybe I'm biased in, in favor of Palestinians. I, I just have had... Mostly good experiences. I've had a lot of friends who are Palestinian. I was at a party and someone said, oh, I'm Palestinian. I'd be like, oh, that's interesting. Really, tell me more about yourself, you know? So I, I find that they're they're generally pretty pretty nice people. And maybe I, I sympathize because of the situation, because of all the all the conflict that we've had. I'll try to go out of my way to be nice to them. And I, and I find that they're very polite in general. So I, I, tend to, I tend to feel comfortable if I'm around Palestinians. I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, man. We love you too, Rafi. Yeah. Thank I you, wish thank for you. Of you, just a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> Dan, I mean, a couple more. I'm trying. I'm spreading the, the, the good word, as they say, as you guys say. Well, cool. Go ahead. Maybe because our the time. Next one. Now let's get back into the, into the mess. What okay. do you, who do you think is to blame for the conflict? Whose fault is it here? <laughs> Are you, you ready? <laughs> do I think to blame. Oh, my God. What a question is that? I think you, you, you mentioned it, but we can, you know, in case anybody forgot how you feel. <laughs> okay, who do I think I blame? Oh, wow. Okay, of course, uh, not only, but first, I blame the mind and the founder of any oppressive uh, plans, which was founded as a main part of Zionism, although with different seasons. Because Zionism is a changing concept, and that's why we... I don't see it as a very valid concept to address much because people just take it however they want all the time. It's like saying, sure. oh, what is your gender identity? Well, uh, queen, mm -hmm. well, well, but it's all gender. Yes. <laughs> so Zionism for me is, uh, so yeah, it's uh, the planner and the instigator of uh, bringing back uh, things by force. Second is us, our reactions. As Palestinians, whether of course I see ourselves as the victim of history, not the victim I'm saying in a victim mentality, not a victim that oh so poor are we like in the sense of we're weak and stupid. No, 
I'm saying poor, uh, uh, sorry, victim as in reality, in uh, court terms, justice terms. So that being said, the victim sometimes can really like withdraw, like avoid using the same violent uh, methodology. Avoid, instead of reacting to the whisper with a shout, we can react to the whispering by questioning the whispering, the very insulting, insultive whispering. And I know I'm belittling the many people. Palestinians may be provoked by me saying, oh, but they didn't do just that, that. But I'm just, please bear with me. Like, it's an analogy. So, yeah, it's our response, reactions, response, reaction, control. That's the second uh, right. uh, responsibility for the continuation. Particularly for me, any, any belief in, in military resistance. Because why would you believe in military resistance when you when you are weaker? It's like believing I can kick uh, the butt of a big muscular guy when I'm a child. It's just a very false, uh, imaginary, kind of fanatical, like uh, fantasy type of belief that will not get anybody somewhere. And even if the bully guy gets uh, provoked, he can break the child in half. <laughs> why? So we we get to lose more. So, like what I think Hamas's uh, ideology is coming. But I understand the, the, the heart where, oh, like, you know, this human, there's this human always, uh, always, or not always, but sometimes at least, it's more than sometimes, where uh, if, if I'm abused, you know, there's this strong anger, even if I'm weaker, but I'm stronger inside. I will show you. I will take revenge. I will get back my right. And there's this, it's fake. It's lack of accepting reality. Many times we're weaker naturally. There is no way to do anything about it. Not, I'm not saying, I'm saying there is no way to do anything about it now. Yeah. Can we plan something for the future? Yes. How, how do we plan it is the question. Not plan it and now already. <laughs> so for me, if Hamas believes in military is as the only solution, at least build yourself militarily. Stop getting engaged militarily. Mm -hmm. And just be like, blah, 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 and then suddenly say, ha, Israel, we surprise you. Now we have enough weapons to fight you in an actual real war. And let's see who wins and gets back whatever rights. If we think. I, I hope they don't go that route. <laughs> no, but I'm saying, but yeah. that, that's not even very possible. It's not feasible yeah. because Israeli, unfortunately, the regime is blocking all of the, we are in a blocked uh, Gaza. So I'm just saying like, uh, this is where this hopelessness kind of thinking comes, but it comes, uh, yes, it's less uh, wise. But yeah, the instigator is the one who's uh, of conflict, is the one to blame the one as people, the one as thoughts, ideologies, concepts, approaches. Those are the ones I think is what we need to uh, blame, let's say, or put responsibility on. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I pretty much agree on the, the main, you know, I mean, I. I I, I'm, I am like a Zionist. I do support the right for Jews to come back here. I know, I, I just know Jewish culture so intimately. It's so an, an essential part of who we are, the belief that we came from here and the belief that we're, we're going to come back, that it's, it's inevitable that we were going to come back. But I think where they went wrong was there was some people that started in the, in the Zionist movement that started to say we could transfer the Palestinians out of here. And that wasn't, that wasn't part of the deal. You know, the world said, we'll support you to come back here. We'll help build a country. You, but everyone who lives here has to be an equal citizen. You want to do that? And, I, you know, at least that's what the world said. I, definitely the, the when they got here, they should have gone and had a conversation because they need your consent, right? If you're here before and I get here, I need to have, I need to have your cooperation. I mean, it's very important to me. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm coming. But let's find a way so that my coming here doesn't hurt you. You know, so you don't have to suffer when I, I want to when I want to return. And there was those that started saying, let's move them out. Let's just get money. We'll put, we'll send them to Iraq. We'll send them to Jordan. We'll do it peacefully. But that idea, that's the mother of ethnic cleansing. That's what you, when you get this idea in your head, I'll pay for them to move them. Then, but that's not going to work. People don't just leave their homes unless people start getting killed. You know, a little bit people will go, but you can't pay people to leave your homeland. That doesn't work. And the, what I, I see is you have some Zionist statements that get published by uh, like a minority maybe of the Zionists saying, I have this new idea. Let's go ra fundraise and buy homes for Palestinians in Iraq and in Jordan. And well, they'll move out here. We'll just give them money. 
And then the Palestinians started to see this and published this in the newspaper in Palestine. And they said, these Zionists are coming here to remove you from your homes. And then uh, shortly after, you see the first attacks. It's the Battle of Tel Chai, you know, up in the, Gal in the Galil. You know, a few, a few Jews and a few Arabs were killed. And then over the course of, of 28 years, from 1920 to 1948, it just got worse and worse and worse. There was attacks with 10 people killed, and then 20 people killed. And then it was just out of control. By the time it's the end, people don't even remember what's going on. There's just two groups trying to murder each other. And it's, it's just a, a, a competition of ethnic cleansing. And then you see in the, resu the results of the war, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me what they, the orders were actually told to the, to the generals at the time. Did, were they allowed to, just, uh, to move them or was it optional, whatever? But the facts were the people were terrified of each other. All the Jews left the West Bank but became Jordan, every, every Jew that was living there. And they left the old city of Jerusalem. And the majority of the Palestinians left the Israeli side. You know, you know, 10 percent of them were left or something. Or 20 percent. So these people had been killing each other for 28 years and they were terrified. And that this all started by not having the conversation like, listen, it's really important for us to come here. We're being we're being persecuted. Have some mercy on us. We, we were, you know, we believe our, our ancestors lived here for thousands of years. Let's find a way to make it work. We want to come back here. We don't want you to suffer. Let's do it right. And they didn't do that. And the people, and, and that's what it, it, it starts with lack of communication and then it, it, it expands into, into outright conflict and violence. That's, that's like anything going bad in life. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, what do you respect about Israeli culture? What is my what, sorry? Oh, so what do you respect? About Israeli culture, what do you like about Israeli culture? Oh, like anything? Like I have <laughs> anything? Pick something you like. Just this. Something I respect. Oh my gosh, tough questions. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I like a direct approach. At times, uh, Israelis can be more direct about saying no. We have a lot of uh, less uh, direct approaches in Palestinian culture, which can be hypocritical at times. In Israeli culture, uh, it's clearer, but it can be rude at times. So it's a it's a whole spectrum. But um, yeah, I like um, the clarity uh, at times. In I like the variety. It's crazy, like the varieties is from all religious conservative, even way more than us Palestinians by 100 degrees <laughs> to, yeah. to like very, very open like Europeans. So I can have like, uh, I can live in all of those spheres and like, I feel like in, I'm in five different countries at once. Uh, this is mm -hmm. fun. Respect yeah. is not the word. I like this. Not respecting, it's not disrespect, not, res not the word. It's Enjoy. Like, uh, yeah, I think it's it's cool. There's something unique about it. Um, yeah, but what I like also maybe not necessarily okay. Can respect also, but uh, like also that at least in some of this form, there's the culture of freedom and respect of women to express themselves. This is what I hate the most about our culture: patriarchal uh, patterns, dishonoring women, being centered around. Controlling women, what I like and respect about Israelis is allowing their women to express themselves. And I'm not speaking about sexuality here or yeah. lack of, uh, you know, like cheating or something or sexual perversions. Or, I'm speaking about like not judging what they dress, where they go. They can go maybe hang out at night. They ha can have a, a safe night life or make friends, travel. Not like women are like as if things they have to keep at home until they get married. Then the, the husband starts controlling them to stay at home until they die. You know, like uh, all of this cycle is too much. So, yes, I like uh, how uh, those things or respect them as well. There's, I'm sure there's more, but I'm saying in a Absolutely. nutshell. Amazing. Appreciate it. So, yeah, what about you? What do you like about our uh, culture? Or, well, I like that the, it's called Samud. I like that, that Palestinians, they don't give up. Even though they're they're being oppressed and and he, well, not even that they're fighting, I find that I like about Palestinians that they're still friendly. I go I'll go meet a Palestinian; he'll still be nice. 
even though like you wait even though we're in a conflict we can say you can still be friendly and drink coffee and do business it's almost it's, it's almost strange to be in a fight with people that you get along with so well and and they don't give up on their on their heritage and their culture and then and when you know the world is telling them you're you're a fake people you don't belong they're like hell no you know I'm, they're sticking to it i i I've, uh, i respect that and I, I like that they're very friendly and polite they're it's showing what the opposite of Israelis. They're not so loud. You go around Palestinians, everyone's quiet and very, very refined. It's a, it's it's refreshing in a way. They have they give a lot of respect to authority. You know, they're not the same way as Israelis, where you're, you know, you go into a business meeting of Israelis. It's not clear who the boss is. Everyone's just you know jumping in and uh, you know shouting on their turn and stuff. But it's also nice Israeli culture because they're very they're very warm and friendly. But it can also be in your face at the same time. They're all like best friends. It's it's like we're all family. It's not there's no there's no hierarchy. Nobody's in charge. You know, that's what's nice about here. But I like I like the, the variety also having Palestinian culture. It's more more traditional, more reserved. People will uh, say please and thank you and very uh, soft spoken. So I appreciate that. And it, it, it's familiar in, in some ways. Thank you. Rafa. My pleasure. Uh, what's your favorite place in Israel, Palestine? Favorite as in? Uh... Give a couple place. A couple places. What do you really like? Like, give give us an example. A beautiful place in this country that you'd like to go. Or something uh, to you. Haifa is uh, is my favorite place. Um, but the place I dislike the most is Jerusalem. But I love the most is Jerusalem. <laughs> wow. I dislike when it comes to being a Palestinian living in you know? it. Mm -hmm. I love for meaning because there's a lot of meaning here to do, to hope and dream for. Haifa, I like, it's my favorite to live. I feel there's the best place uh, for coexistence. Mm -hmm. When I'm saying coexistence, not necessarily even co-resistance, but it's coexistence at least can relationally, socially, among sure. Israelis. And yeah, I'm a social person at the end of the day, like all humans, I, I want to feel in a place where there is less racism than Jerusalem. Uh, so yeah. Cool. What about you? So I, I like Jerusalem. I think the most. This is where I live. This is my my home. From the first day I got here, I uh, I love I love the old city. It's just like it's like a it's like a castle. You know, it's a it's a it's a uh, kind of place you don't see in, yeah. in other parts of the world. And I love the variety of culture. I love the, all the all the Palestinians that I that I get to meet. I go shopping, and everyone everyone who works there's Palestinians. I have coworkers that are that are Palestinians. I like to, I get to practice my Arabic a little bit, which is fun. And I, it's it's just a beautiful culture, and there's there's tourists here. Well, not when Corona, but usually it's such a wide variety of people, and so many obviously so many different Israelis from the ultra orthodox Hasidic to very secular to a, a wide range, a wide range of, of of faces. It's got beautiful weather and beautiful views. You can go into the east and you see the desert, and see you look down to the Dead Sea. You go to the west, you see a beautiful forest. It's a, it's amazing, and there's. Every corner, there's places that are hundreds of years old, and some places thousands of years old to learn about and to see. It's a, a never-ending adventure. The other place I like, I like Safed. I don't know if you've been there, like Svat, as we call it. It's a beautiful place. It's like it, it looks a lot like Jerusalem, but it's a little bit quieter. It's like a quiet little version of Jerusalem, where it's a, there's a good there's a good scene of, uh, of artists and very uh, open-minded people. And I, I also like to, Tiberias, Tiberia, and um, it's also a very old city, and it looks different. It has all, like here, all the stones are white. There, all the stones are black. You know, because it's uh, volcano, volcanic mountains, and it has just a different feel. And you're on the water, right? It's the the city of water. So I, those those are my favorite places, I would say in Israel. A lot, all of it's amazing, but those are those are the places I like. And so the last question of the evening: uh, What gives you hope that uh, things will one day get better? Where where does the hope come from? Uh, my hope is. Uh... And uh, the love of the Creator. And uh, for me, I think nothing gives me love for people who don't deserve it, but except through God Himself, the person of God, who showed Himself through Jesus for me. So this is what brings me hope, and this is what. Um, uh, gives me the uh, um, definitely all meaning to live for 
Otherwise, I would really choose to live for myself, leave this country, very disgusting country, and just establish my fun life somewhere peaceful, really, because I'm a normal human. But for me to have hope and live in a place of conflict, uh, and, uh, and if I consider myself intelligent, I would definitely either leave or be uh, claiming that there is a higher intelligence than me, giving me the real uh, uh, action to hope. Uh, yeah, and my second layer in hope is in humans, uh, despite the very, very, very bad part of the human image. There's a very beautiful side of humans, and it is the image of God again in them. And so, yes, I see in humans the image of beauty and hope that they themselves even don't see necessarily, or myself, I don't see me sometimes enough, which, but it, it is there. And so, yeah, we can always love. The essence is love. The foundation is love. The essence of love. The side is love. And that's the, uh, my source of hope. Fantastic. What so for me, so for me, yes, obviously the the belief in the, in in my my religious traditions that that one day there will be world peace here and that uh, you know the lion will lay with the lamb and the nations will uh, you know won't study war anymore and they'll bring uh, swords into plowshares, but also that what I've seen in my experience in doing you know coexistence work or or as you would call co-resistance. Or you know, be, meeting meeting Palestinians, talking about how do we solve this problem, and I've seen I, even on the, on the groups uh, in in Socha, I've seen places where you'd have a group of Pal where a Palestinian would start challenging, saying Jews aren't really from from Israel, they don't have any rights here, and the Palestinians would start yelling at them and start defending the Jews, and then a Jew would start yelling at the Palestinians, and the Jews would defend the defend the Palestinians, say no, 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 we like the Palestinians, stop picking on them, you know, and that's what I see, you know, when people are. Want to be want to be allies instead of enemies, you know. I, I see there's a glimmer of hope, and when when you see it, it's it's amazing, and uh, that's what I that's what I think the future is. Amazing. Thank you, thank you. Okay. I think I, I think we finished for the evening. We'll uh, we'll do some more. Does Zadar want to say hi? What's up? What's up? That was pretty amazing. I, I very much enjoyed that. Uh, Malcolm, thank you for staying on extra. You gave us 50% uh, more time than you uh, initially said you could. So <laughs> I really appreciate that. I hope, I hope your other commitments aren't, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't interfere with other commitments, but we hope you forgive us. Um, yeah. So we're, we're gonna, we're gonna continue to the after party. Uh, Malcolm sadly won't be there, but Rafi's going to be there. Uh, so I'm going to toss the link in the chat right now. And we will see you there. And Malcolm, um, hopefully we get you to uh, an after party soon enough and back on the channel soon. And Rafi, of course, as really one of our strongest community organizers, um, we'll definitely be seeing seeing more, more from you soon. D didn't you both have... Uh, an, a round two of this planned another hour. Uh, yeah, that's the plan. We we didn't want to stick it into one show because we would get exhausted and uh, and we would, we wouldn't make the, the last question. So we figured break it into two rounds. And uh, yeah, with the next one we're going to talk about solutions. Now that we've talked about who we are, now we now we want to talk about what we want to do. You know, that should be round two. Okay, sounds sounds great. Um... See y'all at the after party. And for those celebrating today, happy 420. Um, make it a good one. Signing off. <laughs>